afternoon. So here this afternoon we have Paul Waper and he's here to talk to us about improving old compression algorithms. Paul started writing code for a ZX80 on a typewriter and things improved a bit since then. They currently work for Red Hat trying to automate so that other people don't have to. Today Paul will discuss his research into improving the LZW algorithm, give a demonstration on encoding and decoding and compare his compression ratios to other more modern compression methods. Please welcome Paul. Thank you very much, and uh, greetings from Ngunnawal country, where I come from, in Canberra. Um, so, compression algorithms has been something I've been really interested in for a long time, so I'm going to give you a bit of a history of compression, uh, some of the theory behind it, some of the algorithm work that I've been doing, and sort of look into the future. Uh, so, I want to take you back to 1977. Who wasn't alive in 1977. Okay, there's a few. So, so I'm going to have to recap some stuff. Um, <laughs> some, some bad things happened. Uh, some good things happened. Uh, the first hints of an internet started appearing. Uh, something particularly important for a lot of people here um, that were alive during this time uh, was these three computers appeared on the scene, the PET, the Apple II, and the TRS-80. And those, uh, along with a number of other um, personal computers, really took computing from stuff that you did maybe at your parents' work or in a library into the home that you could play with yourself. The other important thing, at least for my talk, uh, in, that happened in 1977 was that these two gentlemen, Abraham Lempel on the lev, left, who's uh, sadly passed away, so this talk is kind of dedicated to him, and Jacob Ziv on the right, uh, introduced a compression algorithm called LZ77. Um, strange title, but there you go. Um, the way this works is that we look at the output, uh, we're either outputting sort of literal data or we have a way of saying there's a repeat that's in the output stream that is already in the output and so we refer back to this, we have this sort of tuple in the original paper, um, a bit the distance back to the last match, the length of that match and then the next character that we're going to output. If we have no match, then we just output zeros uh, and we output characters one at a time until we've got enough to actually form a match. Uh, so this basically looks back into a sliding window over the past output uh, to look for matches um, that the encoder can efficiently uh, transmit and the decoder then knows to find in that window. Like, it's impossible to understate the importance of this algorithm. These are the tools, just some of them, that have been influenced by LZ77. Uh, not just the tools, but the algorithms as well. As a LZMA, obviously, is one of them. Um, but there are decompressors for uh, different architectures. There's, so when your memory is very constrained, uh, there are decompressors. Um, algorithms that are optimized particularly for decompression speed. Um, it, 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 they have just been huge. So, uh, we're going to move on, on to another, uh, the next year, 1978. Um, a bunch of bad things happened, uh, a bunch of good things happened. Um, and these two gentlemen, not satisfied with releasing one algorithm, released a second called LZ78. Now this, <laughs> I know, <laughs> they, once you're on a theme, stick to it, right? Um, so uh, this works slightly differently. What it does is it learns sequences of adjacent characters or symbols in the input and puts them into a dictionary and then uh, the output is the uh, longest dictionary entry that matches, that's in the dictionary at the time. Um, I have to take you slightly further forward to give you a good example of this. I'm I need to go forward to 1984. Uh, we were at war with East Asia. 
again. Um, there was a lot of sex crime. Uh, I was 13 at the moment, so I didn't have any of that. But um, Terry Welch, who I don't have a photo of, uh, it released an improvement to LZ78. And it's commonly called LZW. Um, the way this works, which is conceptually a lot easier than LZ78, uh, is that we start with a symbol table that contains the first, the basically all variations of an 8-bit byte. Uh, there's also a flush table symbol and there's a stop input symbol. Um, and we basically add input um, to sort of our buffer until that buffer no longer is, matches an entry in the symbol table. At that point, we know we've got a new symbol. So we uh, add the last symbol that matched, we remember the next character, and we start looking again. So I'm going to give you an example um, of how this works. We're going to be encoding this admittedly very repetitious string, but it's good for my purposes here. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to bear with me for one bit because I'm not going to write out all 256 symbol entries here. I just want you to imagine them. I'm just going to number the symbols that we've got here at the moment. We, so we start with those, uh, the four characters that appear in this string um, as the first four entries in our symbol table. So uh, we read the first B. We're looking ahead to A. There's no BA in the symbol table, so we add that and then we write the symbol B. Uh, we go, we've got the A, we're looking ahead to N, there's no AN symbol, uh, we add that and we write the A. You can see how we're building up this symbol table here. So we add NA, that's good. And now we have our first match. AN is already in the symbol table, so we can look ahead to A. There's no ANA symbol, but now we're outputting essentially a two-character symbol versus just a one-character symbol. Uh, there's no... Uh, we're looking ahead through the space, uh, so there's no A space symbol, so we add that. There's no space B symbol, so we add that. But now, obviously, we're going to start to get these larger symbols building up um, out of symbols that we've added to the symbol table after we started compressing. Uh, we've got an NA here, and that produces the NAN because we're looking at forward to the... Well, our look ahead is to the N symbol, but then we can write NA again, and we know that the... Um, we're looking forward to NA space. The decompressor here basically uh, starts with uh, the B symbol and it, it knows that it's going to write a B something symbol into the table at some point. When it gets the A symbol, it knows that the A there was the first character of that symbol that it needed to write. And so the decompressor and the compressor can work in lockstep building up this same symbol table. So that's the shared knowledge. Uh, and we start getting, encoding that final banana, um, we, and we're outputting symbols that are now three characters in length. Um, so, and we finally basically finish up our input and I've just said, okay, there's no more work to be done. So how does that compare with our original data? Well, we started with four six-byte words and three spaces, so we've got 27 characters, sorry, 27 bytes. Um, we have those symbols that we're needing to output, but uh, in the original LZW algorithm, we have a 12-bit, a 4096 entry symbol table. And so each of those is a 12-bit a number. So we multiply by 1.5 to get 21 bytes. But we've still managed to get some compression, even in this relatively short example. So let's have a, a look at what LZW is giving us and what we could maybe improve. Um, we have this incremental adaptation 
which is good because as the symbol, as the input changes, you get new symbols, you start getting longer symbols um, being made up. Um, but there, um, we're only adding one more character each time. And I think it would be good if we can find a way to expand that to, to increase the, the size of the symbols we're putting into the symbol table sort of faster than that. Uh, other problem is that when we're writing data out initially, um, we only actually need eight bytes, sorry, eight bits, but we're writing 12. Um, and that's a, that's a big overhead, right? Um, we're also limited in this 4096 sim um, entry symbol table. Uh, when we reach the 4096 symbol, we have to literally say, forget everything you ever know about the input stream and start again from scratch. Um, despite all this, uh, this the LZW uh, algorithm is actually used in the GIF-87A and the GIF-89A standards, which is where I need to mention the patents. Hmm. Ordinarily, there's a, a role of ominous thunder at that point, but um, what happened here was Terry Welch was working for Sperry. Sperry got bought by Unisys. Unisys decided to start enforcing the patents on people who wrote uh, algorithms to produce GIF images. Uh, the What was the internet then uh, kind of... Uh, didn't like this, companies didn't like this, uh, companies fought back a bit, um, it was unpopular, uh, Unisys decided not to, and then they decided to do it again, and it was unpopular again. Uh, the patents expired in 2004, but by that time, uh, in sort of early in the 90s, um, the graphics producing community and the web community, as, as it was at the time, decided that the thing that we really needed was a better standard. GIF was also limited to 256 byte color, sorry, 256 color, simple uh, color tables. So we needed true color and better grayscale and things like that. So they the graphics community invented PNG, which, in which used uh, LZ77 and Zlib to do its compression, which was patent, well, patent free. So, that's kind of why I think, that's the other reason why I think uh, LZW doesn't get as much scrutiny these days for what we could do to improve it as maybe uh, LZ77 has. So what can we do to improve LZW? Well, I reckon, firstly, we can find a more efficient way to write the, that initial data that is starting to uh, add to our symbol table. Secondly, the, the, one of the big problems, as you can probably imagine, uh, if you're writing just, uh, say, a text file, you're only using 96 of the 256 characters, and um, that's a whole bunch of symbol table that you have effectively wasted because you're never using it. Uh, so we should start with as, as little as possible in the symbol table. Um, we also want to try to use variable length coding. So one thing that uh, an improvement on Terry uh, LZW that I think Terry Welch suggested was that if we're uh, output if we're less than symbol 512, we only out need to output nine bit symbols. We have already more than eight bit eight bits of symbol in the symbol table, but less than nine bits, so we can always represent those with nine bit numbers. When the uh, compressor adds the 512th symbol, it goes up to 10 bits. When the decompressor recognises that it is on the, fi the 512th symbol, it knows the next symbol is going to be 10 bits. So they're synchronised still. So we can shorten how much data we're actually going to um, send per symbol. I also want to uh, look at ways that we can learn the, the patterns in the data faster. And this is essentially what all of the improvements um, in uh, 
LZ77 over the years have done. They have uh, found ways of getting, uh, finding better matches, um, which also means we need, need a much larger symbol table. I mean, uh, LZMA is typically working with up to four gigabytes of memory. Uh, 4,096 symbols is just not enough, right? The last thing that I want to kind of do in my thoughts about improving uh, LZW is still I wanted to stay true to that idea that we are adding symbols to a dictionary, to a table, um, from how we've built up the input. It would be nice if we could say, okay, this symbol occurred here, like, you know, you're reading a Python program and it uses the word import, so we're going to use, we're going to say directly, right up, uh, the import, the word import is going to be a symbol that you're going to need in the future. Um, and the problem is that that starts looking awfully lot, a lot like LZ77, where we said this amount of data was repeated. And I feel like, that's kind of a, a crossover here. I'd like to stay true to that LZW idea. Okay, so uh, the LZPW algorithm that I've been working on, its main, I think its main uh, improvement is that we alternate lists of literal characters um, and then symbols. We have a different way of writing each of those. And we will basically say, you will write as many literal characters as you can until, uh, and, until there's a symbol that you, you can match, and then you write symbols for as many symbols as you can match until you have to go back to literals. Um, the symbols we're going to form similar to the way that LZW forms them, uh, so that when we read the literal string A, B, C, D, we'll form these three symbols, A, B, B, C, and C, D. Um, the... Uh, at the moment, the way the code works is that when we read the symbols A, B, and C, D, we're also going to create the symbol A, B, C. Now, I, the, what I'm trying to experiment with, and I literally had a uh, brainwave as I was at the end of um, <laughs> Seb Chan's keynote. I don't know why then, but I realised how I can get it to not only add ABC, but in fact add ABCD as a symbol. And if we can do that, then now we're going to expand our, uh, the symbols in our symbol table are going to start expanding much quicker. Um, we're also going to um, store those separate symbols obviously in a separate table, and we're going to start numbering from zero. We're going to literally start with zero symbols in the table. Um, and each of these lists, literals or symbols, is going to be prefixed by lengths, and lengths are going to be written in Fibonacci coding. What's Fibonacci coding, I hear you cry? Well, um, this is a little bit of a diversion, but uh, number bases can be fun. We all use uh, base 10 coding, where you read from right to left, you multiply by the, ba the value of that column in the base, um, add the, the value multiplied by that to produce the number. Uh, and we're obviously familiar with, this, with doing this with binary coding, uh, where we just add uh, the values of each of those bases, where the base increases right from right to left. Um, Fibonacci coding, as you've probably guessed now, um, you, the base values are the Fibonacci numbers. So that number there is 34 plus, one, plus 8 plus 3 plus 2. And you've probably figured out here, hang on, 3 plus 2 is 5. That's also a Fibonacci number. So we should probably write that as um, 8 plus 5. Oh, that's another Fibonacci number. That's 13. So here we can, uh, we can observe that if there's a kind of canonical way to write Fibonacci numbers, you, always, you can always write them using the highest Fibonacci number possible. You'd never need to write two ones side by side. And so the other clever thing about Fibonacci coding is that we're actually going to turn that around and write it left to right increasing, and then add a one bit on the end. And when we see two one bits, we know the number has terminated. OK. Uh, 
So Fibonacci number, Fibonacci coding is self-terminating. Um, it also, in uh, some ways, is resistant to bit errors, which is kind of nice. Um, it's easy to decode because we simply go up the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, it's a greedy encoding algorithm, which is as soon as you know, uh, you can work out the uh, Fibonacci number that's just below or equal to your current number. You subtract that, you write a one, and you write zeros until you get the next Fibonacci number that is, is uh, greater than that. And um, so just less than that or something like that. Yeah, because we're going down, it's less than. Um, and you keep on doing that until you run out of zeros, and then you chuck a one on the front, you reverse it around, and there's your encoding. Um, there are schemes of Fibonacci coding that can cope with writing negative numbers and zeros and things like that. I'm just, we only need to use the simplest here because we're encoding lengths and we never need to write a zero length thing. Okay, so that's enough theory. Um, the last thing I will say about the Fibonacci um, coding is if you look at the other variable length bit codings like Elias gamma coding, and Elias delta coding, they are no more efficient than this, but they require a lot more logic to decode. Um, and, you know, we're really kind of at that theoretical limit. We could write, we could have Huffman tables, but in order to have a Huffman table, you need to have pre-encoded it or have some way of transmitting it, and that adds more bytes. This is kind of efficient, right? Okay, so lengths are going to be stored in Fibonacci coding. So let's have a look at what we do with our example encoding this, uh, this again. So we're going to start out with the literal BAN. We never start in symbol coding, we always start in literal coding because we have nothing in the symbol table. And we write, we add, we're looking forward to the A, so we can write the three symbols BA, AN and NA. And at the point where we're looking at the A and we're looking forward to the N, we can say, oh, that's a symbol entry. We know there might be more than uh, some more symbols, um, but we've got AN, we're looking forward to A something. Um, and here we need to know, with it's uh, useful, or it's sort of important in the algorithm to know that A is a prefix of a symbol somewhere. We've seen it before in our input. If we saw a Q there, um, then we'd know no symbol starts with Q. So we, it's impossible for us to have a symbol with Q that had, you know, is Q something in it, and therefore we can just go straight back to literal coding. But we might be encoding something here that is a symbol because it starts with A, but then we look forward to the space and say, no, there's no A space symbol. At that point, uh, we need to output the A and the space. So we've written two literals. Um, and we've, we're looking forward to the capital B. Uh, so we've added those two more symbols. Important to note here um, that we have um, more than four symbols in the table at this point. This will be important later. Um, but now we can start writing symbols. And obviously, this is kind of going to follow that process that um, LZW uses to construct symbols. We keep on seeing symbols, we add the next character there, um, and we keep on building up this list of symbols that we're going to output until finally we have written the whole input. Okay, so how does this do for um, compa a size comparison compared to the original input? Well, we're going to need to work in bits here, as you've probably guessed, um, and so we need to multiply by eight. So we've got 250, 216 bits in the input. Um, so we're going to write a string of length three, which in Fibonacci coding is 0011, uh, and then we can write the, eight, the, the initial eight bit characters. Uh, then we write a, uh, a symbol run of length one, uh, that is 1-1, one, one. and then the symbol number we needed was uh, 001. There were five, bit, five symbols in the table at that point. 
which is less than eight. So we needed at least three bits to encode that number. Um, so we've written a total of five bits there. Um, we then write two characters, um, and uh, that takes 19 bits. And then this sequence, we've got less than 16 um, symbols in the symbol table when we're writing this, so we can use uh, four-bit uh, yeah, four um, symbol numbers uh, prefixed by the length in um, six bits is 38 bits for a total of 90, by 90 bits, which I, have, I, I think that's pretty cool, right? Um, how does that compare if we were doing that in LZW? Well, we had 14 symbols and they're 12 bits each, and so they're 168 bits. Even if we go down to 9 bits, we still only get 126 bits out of LZW. So this is actually improvement. I, I feel like I'm, I'm on the right track here somewhere. Okay. Uh, so how does this do with more real-world data? Uh, so I ran, it, uh, ran this on its own source code, uh, and that got a ratio of about 2.56 to 1. Um, user shared dict words uh, compressed down slightly less, less. Okay, how does that compare to something as old as gzip? Okay, well, we've still got work to do then. Um, it's not surprising because I think there are a lot of improvements we, that we can get. But I would just want to couple, cover a couple of things in the code, uh, which is at my GitHub address, um, before I sort of summarise on what, um, uh, what, what the current state of it is and where the future is going. Um, so the code... I'll firstly say is still extremely experimental. There's a lot of ideas that are tried out um, that are that I've got you know um, uh, flags on to say if if we're using this this particular encoding, try this that sort of stuff. Um, I'm trying to keep as many ideas in there because I want to find out which work what works and what what doesn't um, and. This is still early code, so I, I'm really still not sure which of these ideas might prove to be useful, as, as you'll see. The second is uh, people who know me will kind of recognise um, my sense of humour here, but there's the thing called the Mabulate flag. Uh, now, Mabulate is a, a word I invented. It's what you do, say... Uh, if you've got a Rubik's Cube and you know that uh, the way to solve it is to get all of the colours on each face all together, and the way to do that is by rotating the faces, but you don't know, because you haven't learned yet, the, the specific algorithms to move things around, but you think that if you keep on sort of playing with it, something might end up in the right shape and, it, you know, and colours might be able to move together. And you'll kind of gradually learn your way around, but you're not quite sure what you're doing. So that's mabulating. Uh, so the mabulate flag works like this. Uh, it is basically that uh, process that we did where, lo where we're looking at uh, whether this symbol is a prefix, whether we've possibly got a, a, another symbol because we've got the prefix. If the symbol hasn't matched and the last character is a prefix, then we set that flag and we, that's to remember the character that we're currently on because it could be the start of the new, the new symbol. If the symbol hasn't matched and the last character uh, or the, last, the symbol that we're looking for is not a symbol, then we go... We now need to go to literals. And if the Mabulate flag is set at that point, it means that we previously looked at a character which might have been a prefix, but turns out not to be. And at that point, we need to output that character as well. Um, so it's a bit complicated. And as I said, I, I, I scratched my head for a long time trying to find the right word for this, and I just couldn't, so I used Mabulate because that's me. Okay, 
Um, so the other thing you need to know about the code is that uh, there's this array, uh, this thing called variable called to write um, that if we're in literal mode is a string of the physical characters that we're going to write out. If, it, if we're in symbol mode, that is a list of strings. Um, so don't enforce type um, checking on that because it's going to change. Okay, so where are we uh, with LZPW? Uh, the first thing I do need to share with you is the failures. Um, the one really interesting thing I discovered almost by accident uh, was that I had started on a totally wrong premise. I thought that it would be more efficient to write the symbols in the symbol table using Fibonacci codes. And if we wrote those in, uh, a, if we used like a move to front algorithm or we favoured the re least, so the, yeah, the, the most recent symbol, uh, the most recent symbol is the most complex and it's the, most, the one most um, recently found in the input. So if we can match that using fewer bits, then... Uh, we, we should actually, like uh, this is how I was thinking, we sh that should give us better compression than if we're just using a fixed width number of bits based on the symbol table size at that point in time. And I tried this out and I had spent months working on that and then I was going through tidying up the code, trying to make it vaguely presentable for this conference um, and I, uh, the, one of the things that uh, was set in there was the ability to uh, use variable length Fibonacci coding for symbols or still use fixed length coding. Uh, and in one of my tests, I uh, ran it and um, left the flag off. Uh, so it was using fif fixed length, length symbols and it was shorter. I'm like, okay, well, that's that idea out the window. Why is that? And then I realized that if you think about the idea of Fibonacci coding, part of the reason of that final one is that it has to tell the decoder this is where you, where you stop. It needs, there needs to be an explicit piece of information passed from the encoder to the decoder to say this is the length of that symbol. But if we already know the symbol table size, that's an implicit piece of data that both the encoder and the decoder know and therefore it doesn't need to be transmitted. And there, therefore we can actually use more of the, the bit space to transmit information as opposed to avoiding writing two ones together. So that was a discovery, um, but I'm glad I discovered it. Right? <laughs> um, the other idea that I've had in there, um, which the moment I pretty much removed, but it's there because it, you, know, you never know, um, is uh, the idea of having a header in front of literal blocks and in front of symbol blocks that would both indicate, yes, this is a literal block or a symbol block, and then might indicate some flags about that. Um, and I'll cover some of the reasons why I think this might be useful. There is never a situation where you need to write two literal blocks one after the other because all, you will always find it is more efficient to simply join them together. It's possible that we might need to write two symbol blocks one after the other, and that would most likely be when we have, we're just about to change symbol sizes and we want to write the, all of the symbols currently in the buffer out in the shorter format and then move on to the longer format. But I'm not sure yet if having an extra bit in the header of the symbol list is worth that overhead. It, we're going to experiment, right? Okay, so uh, current features are basically that it does do efficient literal coding and it does do efficient variable coding of symbols. And I'm really proud of that. Um, the future features... One of the main ones that I'm working on is the ability to backtrack through how you're encoding the symbols at this point. And the easiest way to demonstrate this, I've found it's a bit of a boring string, it's not as good as bananas, but uh, it is this. So as we're reading through that to write it, we write the first 
five characters the then have a b b c c d and d dot uh, dot a then we can write a b c d and at that point we add the a b c symbol um, we add we have to add a literal comma um, and then the symbol table has a b c d and the a b c symbol so we're about to read ABC. Um, we get to ABC and we're looking at D. We, we're, we're mabulating that. We're looking ahead to C and there's no DC in the symbol table. So we would have to write a, a literal D at that point and then move on. But um, what if we could instead write that as the symbols ABCD? We've rearranged the, the symbols that we're encoding, and then we can write a second CD, and we're, the, it is always more efficient. Like, that uh, second D there was 10 bits of uh, stepping back into literals. That's a that's a 10-bit symbol that we could put in there. That's, that's you know, a, we, we're, if we we're a 1,024 symbols in our table, we're still going to be more efficient just to write that one character. And we're probably going to write more than one, which means we're probably saving 19 bits. So um, we've got that, it, that option of uh, thinking about how we encode those symbols. It then does mean that it... Uh, we may change what symbols uh, the decoder sees in its symbol table. And this is something that's really important. Um, this is where I'm going to have to really play with this uh, to, try and to try and understand what the effects of that rearrangement are. Um, the other thing that I found uh, when I was playing around with this, it worked fine with some of my test examples and I gave it the code of symbolizer to encode and it used all 32 gigs of my machine and I had to kill it because it was running on flat out on a CPU. And the reason for that was that it was looking through a list of about um, a string probably in the order of... Um, 80 to 90 characters, but it was doing this, like thousands of rearrangements of that, uh, finding every possible way that you could rewrite that. Um, so I have some ideas on how to improve that. Um, the other way, the other ideas that I think we, I, I want to explore here are that uh, it would be good rather than having some sort of signal to say throw away your symbol table and start again from scratch if we could throw away the symbols we never needed b again or the symbols that just hadn't been used recently we could tell the decoder to forget those even if we used fi fixed length uh, coding maybe we still need a move to front idea so that uh, the uh, the later symbols, the least recently used symbols can be thrown out rather than, say, going up to a higher symbol table or symbol length. Um, what if we had literals that don't create symbols? We know we've got a header that we never ever see again in the input and we just say it, the decoder should not encode symbols from this because you're just wasting symbol space. What if we had uh, literals that don't create output but create symbols? We could say, uh, recognize some patterns. Uh, the, you know, in the first sort of um, 10, 20, 100 symbols, find the most efficient way to write those in a compact string and then transmit that to build the symbol table that we're then going to use um, to get um, to st sort of almost immediately go into symbol output. Uh, what if we are, are encoding not just one stream, but multiple streams, like a tar file or something like that? Could we maybe uh, sometimes share this symbol table with the next file or throw it away and it's re we're reading something completely different? Um, this last one was uh, prompted from a friend of mine who asked me, would it be, how would it go 
um, reading Chinese characters, and I realized that actually at the moment I've been talking about bytes throughout my code, but in fact my code is written around Pyth Python's interpretation of UTF-8. And that means that if the literals still contain UTF-8 characters, which are perfectly readable in, as a, an input stream, they're still just bytes at the end of the day, but the symbol table is now not built up of those bytes, but of the characters that have more meaning in the text, that too could be, you know, could give us more, enco um, more compression. If we're reading something like WAV files, um, which are notoriously hard to compress because the, uh, if you're look, looking at, say, 16-bit uh, PCM, uh, encoded each sample is two bytes. But the, there is no relationship between, essentially, between the, the least, the, the lowest byte of sample one and the highest byte of sample two. But as 16-bit words, they are absolutely related. And if we could encode them as symbols rather than simply treating it as a stream of bytes, I think that would give us improvements as well. So there's a whole bunch of ideas that are, I'm percolating away. Uh, I'm still working on the code, but I'm hoping to have some more results soon. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Um. Uh, unfortunately, we're actually out of time. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, and we're in room change, so we, we can't really go over time like we did do before lunch. Um, so I'm wondering, yeah, would you be okay with uh, people asking? Come up and ask me yeah. any questions you like. I, I'd love to have collaboration on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again.